welcome to my coronavirus classroom. This is the first semester of anatomy and physiology exam two review, which covers the nervous and entanglement systems. This nervous system is a big thing, and this has more than just our brain and spinal cord going on in it. We've got our nerves, we've got our receptors, we've got our special senses. So all of that is coming in this exam. A lot of information. So, the thing about a ridiculous exam review is that I figure you probably can't tell. Is this the professor being ridiculous, just like an exam review in the living room? Or is this the assistant pretending to be the professor pretending to be ridiculous? I don't know. I'm going to leave it up to you to figure out. I'm not going to use the mic because I just realized that I've left it on this whole time and there's a great chance that the battery's dead. Which stinks because it's a weird little battery. Well, we'll not talk about that. First question. The door shuts loudly behind you and you flinch. Your heart rate increases as a result. Both responses are due to activation of blank nervous system. A. Autonomic. B. Somatic. C. Preponderant. D. All of the above. E. A and B only. Yeah, you got it. A and B only. Preponderant is a preposterous answer. It's a distractor. This asks about both responses. The autonomic nervous system is responsible for which part? Your heart rate increase, right? Your somatic nervous system is responsible for your muscles contracting and your flinching. All right. So I think I asked this question in class this way, but maybe not. The door shuts loudly behind you and you flinch. Your heart rate increases as a result. This response is due to activation of blank nervous system. This is a different question, and a lot of people get annoyed right here because they're like, oh, this is an English issue, not a science issue. And I would say, well, that's true. But if you're going to take, like, an NCLEX in the United States, there's a great chance that you will have to take it in English. And so it's important to be aware of some things. This response, your heart rate increasing, is due to a result of, yes, A, your autonomic nervous system. Okay, at rest, there's a higher concentration of blank ions outside of the cell and blank ions inside the cell. A, sodium and potassium, B, calcium and chloride, C, sodium and chloride, D, all of the above. Why don't you read that over for a moment? All right, the answer is A, sodium and potassium. So this is a review, so I will go ahead and review something here really quickly. I'm not going to do a like a review of everything that you could watch all the videos for, but I will do some part of a review. This part of the review kind of relates to action potentials, and why do I care about this? We, this was for your last test. Everything builds on everything, and if you don't understand ion differences in nervous tissue, then you don't understand what's going on. So, well, ion differences, in, like, you know, what that means for nervous tissue, say, like, being able to conduct an action potential, the only way we can do that is if we have differing concentrations of ions in, inside and outside the cell. So outside the cell, we have a lot of sodium, okay? Inside the cell, that's a positively charged ion, which means it's a cation. Inside the cell, we also have another positively charged ion, a cation. And the weird thing that can be kind of confusing for students is that it's the movement of these two positively charged ions that's changing the membrane potential we can read right here. And we're starting at rest at negative 70 millivolts. And we're going all the way up to positive 30 millivolts and all the way down to negative 90 millivolts in the swing of this thing called an action potential. How is that possible if all we're talking about is the movement of positive ions? Well, because if we have a ton of positive ions come into this cell at one point, say a ton of positive sodium ions come in and bring us to positive 30 millivolts, that's great, wonderful. Okay. Well, in order to come all the way down to negative, I've got to have positive charge leave. And I can do that 
has potassium, once the sodium channel closes, when potassium exits, this is a positive charge leaving the cell, and it's going to bring us down to negative 90 millivolts. Okay? So be aware of that. And <laughs> I'm going to take off my slipper so that they stop squeaking. I don't have to worry about whether or not you think I'm farting. And what? Oh, here's a review question. Which color that is involved in spig skin? <laughs> Which color is involved in skin pigment would be involved in making my cheeks flush if I actually did fart? And it wasn't my slipper making that noise. It would be hemoglobin, right? Yes. It would be. Okay. Anyway, where the heck was I? I'm not editing this whole ridiculous review. I'm the assistant. <laughs> okay, so if positive charge is rushing out of the cell, then that's what will make us negative again. And then we reset this different concentration due to the sodium potassium pump. Okay, well another thing to be aware of is that there are some other ions that are imbalanced here. The ion that goes with sodium is what? Chloride ion, right? So it's in higher concentration outside the cell. But what's going to be important to be aware of as well, not only when we think about how nervous tissue functions, but when we think about how muscle tissue functions, is that calcium is higher outside the cell. So, yeah, you wear that? Oh, you can't tell that this is probably light blue and that's green. Okay, so that's a little review thing that you should just keep in your back pocket. Don't forget how an action potential works. We are not done with those things, people, and you're not even going to be done with the next semester because we have to talk about cardiac muscles still. So, on that note, back to our review. All right, changes in the information detected by sensory receptors are known as A, stimuli, B, perception, C, interpretations, D, all of the above, E, A and B only. Yeah, stimuli, receptors are detecting changes in variables, different types of information, known as stimuli, which of the following receptors are not encapsulated by a connective tissue sheath? A, nociceptors, B, heteroplexes, C's. <laughs> C, muscle spindles, D, all of the above, E, A and B only. Yeah, you're right, A and B only. The muscle spindle is encapsulated in a connective tissue sheath. We'll have a review of our receptors in just a moment. Somatic motor output is handled by the blank of the cerebrum. A, the frontal lobes, B, the cerebrum, C, the thalamus, D, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is A, frontal lobes. <clears throat> I feel like in class I don't read these out loud. Well, maybe I do. I don't. I don't read the answer options out loud in a face-to-face -face class. And so because of that, maybe it wouldn't have been so obvious that I asked cerebrum and cerebrum. Because a lot of people will choose all of the above, which is the distractor answer. Somatic motor output arises from where in the frontal lobes? The precentral gyri. All right, tapping the patellar ligament will activate the blank reflex. A, tendon, B, stretch, C, flexor, D, all of the above. Yeah, the answer is it activates the stretch reflex. Okay, and that's weird, I know, because um, it just trips your quadriceps and works out and makes you think you're overstretching, even though what you're hitting is um, a ligament, which is attaching your patella to your tibial tuberosity on your tibia. But the thing about it, underneath this scratch out here, it says tendon. What happens is your quadriceps femoris tendon blends with the patellar ligament and both attach to your tibial tuberosity. We will discuss that more when we get to muscles for the next chapter. I'm going to change the lighting a little bit so that we can do a quick board review. Okay, so we started learning this stuff from the top down. So why don't we review it from the bottom up. So if we think about it, we kind of the simplest of our systems was the integument, right? Which was composed of the hair and the skin and the nails, well the integumentary system. The integument is just the skin. So our integumentary system has the hair, the skin, and the nails, the integument of the skin, and it had two major divisions. What were they? the epidermis and the 
the dermis, right? What type of tissue is the epidermis? It's keratinized, stratified, squamous, epithelial tissue, okay? What type of tissue is the dermis? It's connective tissue, but there are two layers, right? The papillary layer, which creates those friction ridges in your skin. What type of tissue is that? It's areolar connective tissue. And then below that, we have the reticular layer, which is what type of tissue? Dense, irregular connective tissue, right? So this is giving the skin the ability to move and resist tension in all directions. The areolar connective tissue is attaching that and providing blood supply to the overlying stratified squamous epithelial tissue, which is going to be able to rap rapidly regenerate so that we can slough off these dead layers at the top. So if we want to kind of review the skin really quickly, then we could say down here we have our reticular layer. Here's the papillary layer. Okay, so we've got our stratum basali here, stratum spinosum here, stratum granulosum here, stratum lucidum here, stratum corneum here, epithelial derived structures that reside in the skin, the uh, hair follicle that supports our hair and our various types of glands. This is an eccrine sweat gland, which is merocrine by method of release. It releases that salty waste sweat, sweat, sweat that helps with uh, temperature regulation. And we've also got a sebaceous gland here that releases sebum onto a hair follicle uh, or into the hair follicle so that it goes onto the hair and makes it soft and pliable. You can see that there. There's an erector pili muscle associated with the hair follicle, a hair root plexus. It's not the best hair root plexus I saw all day, but they help detect hair deflection. We've got an erector pili muscle. So that's everything that we need to know about the hair, I think. Uh, as far as our dermis and epidermis go, uh, the cells that we have in the epidermis are primarily keratinocytes, and we find those throughout all of our layers. We then have melanocytes that add our melanin, the dark pigment that we find in skin. The bodies of the melanocytes are in the stratum basali, but they stretch their feet up into the stratum spinosum. Um, also there in the stratum basali, we have our uh, tactile cells. Actually, I'm gonna put those last. So next we've got dendritic cells. And our dendritic cells are the phagocytic cells that we find wandering through the uh, stratum spinosum. And then last, we have our tactile cells. And the reason that I'm putting these last is because this is how we're going to work our way up from the skin, or one of the ways that we can. Our tactile cells are hooked up to a free nerve ending, which is a sensory receptor that we met in chapter 13. So together they make a tactile disc in responding to, to very low levels of light pressure. Okay, so okay, tactile cells. That's their job then, is to help be part of this sensory receptor for light pressure. Exteroreceptor, mechanoreceptor, dermis. Uh, here is where we have our blood vessels and uh, major nerves that are um, branching in to serve the skin. This is also where we find our tactile, lamellar, and bulbous corpuscles, external receptors, mechanical receptors, responding to various types of pressure and vibration. Okay, so those are receptors. Then, what else do we need to say about skin? Anything? I mean, review your glands, your various types of glands that are epithelial derived structures that reside in the dermis. So we talked about eccrine sweat glands just a moment ago, apocrine sweat glands, how many axillary and pubic regions, um, uh, serumenous glands found in your ear, we talked about sebaceous glands found in your hair follicle. So review your glands, uh, exocrine glands of the skin. I think that's all we need to know from the skin. All the rest of it is more confusing. So these are all of our various sensory receptors from the skin, right? That are going to then be talking to what type of neuron? 
It's a sensory neuron, and it's a first order neuron, and since it's coming from the skin, it's a unipolar neuron who has its soma residing in the ganglion of a spinal nerve. That is hugely important because nerves are from chapter 13. So that was chapter five. Check, okay. Chapter 13, nerves, peripheral nervous system is what we're talking about now. Um, do I actually want to do this? Yeah, let's talk through this part of it and then we're going to go through special, nerve, special senses for the receptor part and how it relates to the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system as well. Awesome. Woohoo! Yeah, oh, this is going to be great. Okay, so these are first order sensory neurons. They are, since they're in our skin, they are unipolar. Um, what else do we want to know about them? That's it. Okay, so then they're going to synapse onto our second order neurons somewhere in the central nervous system. And different receptors synapse onto their second order inner neurons at different places. Some receptors interact with first order neurons that synapse with their second order neuron right there at the level of the spinal cord that the first order neuron is coming in at. Other receptors talk to sensory neurons who extend their axons all the way up the spinal cord and synapse on their inner neuron in the brain stem. So, and then, yeah, and in the other case, then the inner neurons are going up. So, I'm not gonna make you worry about the nitty gritty details of each pathway, because you can do that in neurophysiology, but just be aware that <clears throat> we've got some first order sensory neuron whose peripheral process is contacting a sensory receptor in the skin, and its central process is extending to somewhere in the central nervous system to synapse onto our second order inner neuron. The pathway is also going to decussate at some point, and I'm not gonna make you worry about those details either, but we'll just say that these are our second order uh, neurons. Because we relay our information up, right? It's true, we do. And our second order neurons are going to synapse on third order neurons that are going to bring information to the part of your brain that's responsible for processing general somatosensory information. Where's that? To parietal lobes, right? Yeah, so we will synapse on our third order neurons that are uh, by structural classification multipolar. Oh, these are also multipolar down here. And so, and we're synapsing on our primary somatosensory cortex, which is in your parietal lobes. Okay, that is not how you spell parietal, but you probably can't see it anyway. Okay, awesome. Now, general sensory information then is going to travel through spinal nerves. And you have somatic sensory information about which you're aware, but you also have visceral sensory information about which you are unaware. So your hypothalamus is paying attention to all of that. So, okay, wonderful. We've gotta to get to all of that stuff too. So, um, what else do we wanna say? Nerves are these axons of neurons running together in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, we've got neurons, individual neurons are surrounded in endoneurium, which is um, our areolar connective tissue that electrically insulates them from each other. We get fascicles of neurons then grouped together and surrounded by perineurium, which is dense irregular connective tissue. Fascicles of neurons are then gathered together in a nerve which is surrounded in dense irregular connective tissue that's called epineurium. So all of those nerves now, if we were to look in here, all of those neurons are these unipolar sensory neurons who have their bodies then in these spinal ganglia. So if we're thinking about peripheral nervous system, we've got our receptors that we just talked about, and then we've got our nerves, and we've got spinal nerves and cranial nerves, all of our spinal nerves are mixed. Um, spinal is what we're talking about now. So our spinal nerves are gonna have those 
um, dorsal root ganglia. We can see. And um, then you would see, yeah, they're gonna come in and synapse in the spinal cord. Uh, what else? So spinal nerves. How many sets of spinal nerves do we have? Oh, 31. What are they? We've got our cervical nerves. How many? Eight. One through eight. Then we've got our thoracic. How many? Twelve. One through twelve. Then we've got our lumbar. How many? Five. One through five. Then we have our sacral. How many? Five. One through five. And then we've got our coccygeal. How many? One. So, 8 plus 12 is 20, plus 10 is 31, 31 sets of spinal nerves, okay? Cervical nerves come together and branch to form your cervical plexus, which gives rise um, uh, to, or serves all the muscles that control your head and neck and upper shoulders, uh, branches in further than we have our, um, uh, what else do I want to say? Brachial plexus that serves the arms, lumbar and sacral plexus that serve the leg. Um, what else? Those are the spinal nerves. All right, cranial nerves. So those are also part of the peripheral nervous system, and they're talking to receptors from our special senses, which is chapter 15. So we're going to talk that, about that too. Okay, so quickly for our special sense, let's start with the special sense of smell. What's the receptor? The olfactory receptor cell that's part of what special sense organ? The olfactory epithelium. So what's the stimulus? An odorant in what? Mucus is going to stimulate an olfactory receptor cell. Who's talking to who? It's going up through, so the olfactory receptor cells, if you recall, are those bipolar neurons who are going up through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and talking to who? Mitral cells. Okay, and the mitral cells are extending their axons back um, in the olfactory tract. So the olfactory bulb is this enlarged region right there where all these synapses are happening. So uh, our olfactory receptor cells talk to our mitral cells. These are our first order neurons. No, no. These are our first order modified first order neurons. These are our second order neurons. And these will directly synapse in the primary olfactory cortex, which is where? It's in the temporal lobe. So, okay, great. Now I'm aware that I smelled something. Some extensions now, some third order neurons will extend away to the frontal lobe. And now I can start distinguishing what it is that I smell. Okay, from here, some other neurons can go and synapse on the temporal lobe. And then they'll extend other neurons to the frontal lobe. Okay, great. And then from here, I can also extend neurons to the hypothalamus and the limbic system and the amygdala, all of those really complex parts that are involved in uh, the processing of the sense of smell. Okay? All right. So smell is 80% of taste. Gustation begins with what is a stimulus? A tastin suspended in what? Saliva. And now that is going to stimulate what? What's the receptor for the special sense of taste? A gustatory cell. And so what's the stimulus? Taste it in saliva. Taste it in saliva. This is going to stimulate a gustatory cell. And this is part of a taste bud. And our gustatory cells are in taste buds on all over our tongue. Uh, the taste buds on the anterior two-thirds of our tongue are hooked up to which nerve? The facial nerve. So for the anterior two-thirds, the receptor is the gustatory cell. The first order neuron is running in the facial nerve. OK? 
Okay, for the posterior one-third of your tongue, the first order neuron is running in your glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay? And then, from here, our first order neurons are going to synapse in the brainstem on our second order neurons, which are going to synapse in the thalamus, which is going to extend the primary gustatory cortex. Okay, I should have done those in different colors. First order neurons are in the facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. Those are synapsing in the brainstem. Our second order neurons rise from the brain stem to the thalamus. Because the thalamus is a sensory relay station for everything except the sense of smell. Sure, some smell does go through the thalamus, but it doesn't have to for you to be aware of it. Okay, so from the thalamus then, our third order neurons are going to extend away to the primary gustatory, ugh, primary gustatory cortex where? The insula. Okay, great. That's awesome. What a great review. Okay, now that was taste and smell. And this is like more nerves too. So we've got some of our cranial nerves covered. We've got chapter 15 special senses going. So awesome. Now, the hearing and vision, slightly more complex. Okay, let's just start with vision, the most complex of the complex. Why not? What's the stimulus? It's a photon of light, right? And what's it passing through? Oh, it's passing through your cornea. It's going past your iris as it goes through the pupil and hits the lens. And then the lens is going to reflect it onto your retina. And then it's going to be processed from the rods and the cones, which are the, oh, I was supposed to be asking all these questions. The, the special sense organ is the retina, the sensory receptors are the rods and cones. What do rods respond to? Black and white line orientation. What do cones respond to? Color. Okay, so rods and cones are going to tell my bipolar cells, who are going to tell my ganglion cells, who are going to shoot their axons back in the optic nerve. Okay, so let's just imagine these are my eyeballs, my retina is now, the right side of my eyeball is seeing the left side of the world, the left side of my eyeball is seeing the right side of the world, information being transmitted back along neurons that are running in optic nerves which is cranial nerve number two. And okay, so the weird thing is then that at the optic chiasm, the medial information from each eye crosses over so that when you continue back in your optic tract, each optic tract has information about half of the visual field from both eyes. That information is going to go to some places. It's gonna to go to the thalamus and then back to, okay, so to the thalamus and then where? Okay, well actually first let's do our first order, second order, third order neuron nonsense. Our bipolar cells are our first order. Our ganglion cells are our second order neurons. These are synapsing. The ones in the thalamus are uh, going then back to our primary, um, primary visual cortex, which is where? In the occipital lobes, right? Yeah, okay. Then we also have some shooting back to the midbrain. Uh, for our visual reflexes. So, um, yeah, I don't know. And then there's also some shooting through the hypothalamus and the pineal gland gets some input as well. So vision is horribly complex. Uh, the most important part we just went over, which is how we get to conscious perception from this whole nonsense. It's not nonsense, it's beautiful. Okay, last thing, hearing, and then, did I really get everything? Um, 12, yeah, that was well, most of everything. 12 last one I need to review. Okay, hearing. So, sound waves are funneled in through your ears, which will get bigger with time, right? Because uh, oh, cartilage never stops growing. Oh, you don't know that yet. Maybe you'll know that later. Okay, so funneled in through the elastic cartilage of your ear, the helix, 
uh, auricle, helix, and lobule make your external ear. Uh, external acoustic meatus is also part of your external ear. Sound waves funneled in, hit your tympanic membrane. Those are going to rock the auditory ossicles in your middle ear. Uh, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Stapes knocks on the oval window, which is attached to the vestibule, which leads into the cochlea, which is round around, wound around, I think like two and a half times. And deep in here, we've got the special sense, sensory organ of hearing, which is the spiral organ or the organ of corti. And in there, we have the sensory receptor cells, which are hair cells. So hair cells are mechanoreceptors. What? Yeah, so they are responding when they move, and they move when the basilar membrane moves. So when the stapes knocks on the old window, it's going to send these vibrations through this fluid in your cochlea, and anything we can hear is going to rock this membrane called the basilar membrane. So our fluid's down here and it's moving. And we're gonna rock the basilar membrane. The hair cells have these stereocilia, these hairs, that are stuck in this other membrane, the tectorial membrane. It doesn't move. So if I'm not moving up here, but I am moving down here, I'm gonna get all agitated and cause uh, a pot potentials to be generated in what nerve? It's the vestibular cochlear nerve, but it's the cochlear branch of that. The vestibular branch is attached to the vestibule and is paying attention to the location of your head in space. So it helps with balance and equilibrium. Okay, so this is our first order neuron. Our first order neuron is in our vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number eight. And uh, that is gonna run back and synapse on our second order neuron in the brain stem. And that is going to, I guess I should do it up. It's going to go up. So we'll go up, well, I mean, guess back to the brain stem, but then up to the thalamus. So our second order neuron is in the brain stem. And that's going to arise to the thalamus, where it synapses onto our third order neuron, which is going to synapse where? Or which is going to um, terminate where? Where's our primary auditory cortex? Our temporal lobes. Okay, so that was peripheral nervous system as far as receptors, nerves, that was special senses as far as receptors go. Let's have a quick review of the rest of our cranial nerves. Ooh, 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 to touch and feel very good. Velvet, aha. Okay. Some say marry money, but my brother says big brains matter more. Olfactory, special sense of smell. Optic, special sense of smell. We just talked about ocular motor, motor output to the eye. Trochlear, motor output to the eye. Trigeminal is mixed with sensory output to your, I mean, motor output to the muscles of facial, your face and bringing in sensory information, general sensory information from your face as well. Accessory, oh, this is abducens, is motor output to the eye. This is facial, which is mixed, it's bringing in sensory information from the anterior two thirds of your tongue and carrying out motor information to muscles of facial expression. Uh, this is vestibular cochlear, which is involved with a special sense of hearing and equilibrium. This is glossopharyngeal, which is a mixed nerve taking sensory information from the posterior one third of your tongue and bringing motor output to the muscles of your pharynx. This is the vagus nerve, which is a mixed nerve. It brings sensory information, visceral sensory information from all of your guts and carries out so, um, visceral motor output of which you are unaware. This is a, the spinal accessory nerve, which controls muscles uh, that power your shoulders, uh, trapezius primarily, and then hypoglossal, which mm, helps to move the muscles of your tongue. So that was peripheral nervous system. So we've got 15 check, we got five check, we got 13 check, we got 12, almost. Okay, so 12 was the central nervous system, our brain and our spinal cord. So we've been talking about this a little bit as we've gone through all of this because it's what's been processing it. So our spinal cord has the ascending tracts. 
that are taking all of the information up to your brain through those pathways we just talked about. It has the descending tracks that are bringing down motor output that we haven't really talked about, but we will for our next exam and a lot next semester. Okay? All right, spinal cord. I mean, not horribly interesting, but horribly interesting. Okay, brain has four regions. Your cerebra, which is broken into lobes. Your cerebral hemispheres have frontal lobes, parietal lobes, occipital lobes, temporal lobes, and deep to all that nonsense is the insula. It's not nonsense, it's wonderful. Okay, we've talked about a little bit about what all of that does. Maybe we should have gone from the other way. So if we're talking from the spinal cord up, what's next? The brain stem, right, where we've got the medulla oblongata, which controls our vital signs. Our pons is above that, which can alter uh, what's going on down there if need be, like change respiration rate if we must. Uh, and then above that, we've got the midbrain, which is responding to our visual and auditory reflexes. Those are all parts of the brain stem. Okay, on the posterior aspect, to the inferior aspect of the brain, we have the cerebellum. That's comparing input to output to see that what we are actually doing is what we want to be doing. So if I'm trying to send down a motor command from my frontal lobes, as that's going down, some information shooting back to my cerebellum and then going out to my muscles. The information from my proprioceptors, I guess that we didn't review from here, I'm going to let you review that on your own. The proprioceptors, uh, that's part here too, our reflexes, review it on your own. <laughs> um, the information from the proprioceptors is going to be coming up through our ascending tracts and some of that's going to be going back to the cerebellum. If the two don't match, then the cerebellum will make adjustments so that you can actually execute the movement that you want to do. Uh, and then up from there we've got the diencephalon, which has the thalamus, which we just talked a lot about, the sensory relay station, the hypothalamus, which is the autonomic, um, sorry, it's the master regulator of the autonomic nervous system we'll talk about soon, and the endocrine system we'll talk about next semester. It's paying attention to all of the stuff coming into the brainstem because it's regulating the autonomic stuff, so be aware of that. Um, and then what else? Uh, uh, the epithalamus or the pineal gland, which is um, paying attention to light and secreting melatonin to make you sleepy. That's chapter 12. I really truly believe that we've reviewed mostly everything and I've asked you lots of questions. It's late at night. I'm going to just be the grumpy assistant and let you have the cheery professor tomorrow in the teacher helping students succeed discussion page. Good night. <laughs>